So good to be with you today, and uh, we're so excited for the journey we are on as Southside Church. Uh, it's been four years of journeying, and this is, of course, the first time since the early lockdown that we can begin developing and gaining momentum together and growing. And so as we expand, as we have this passion and this conviction to multiply, never just become maintainers, uh, I want to encourage you about a few key next steps you can take personally in your pathway to spiritual growth. Well, God's Word said those that says those that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish. There's a kingdom principle there. The house of the Lord. Old Testament is now translated into what the church is, the place we come to sit under teaching and gather together as the ecclesia, which is the Greek word for what we know as church. And so being planted is a very practical uh, way of ensuring you're embracing the fullness of every opportunity to grow in your spiritual walk. And we know people come into church and it can be so difficult. Usually you walk into church, the first thing you find is groups of people just having little talks. And you're like, ah, you know, like, what do I do now? Do I go and say friend or whatever? Maybe I don't fit here. So you'll see we always introduce ourselves like you've never heard or known who we are because we don't assume you do. Um, uh, and so you, people struggle. You know, you might go outside now and have a cup of coffee and say, Lord, please make the right person bump into me so I can make a friend here. You know, awkward. What do I do? Do I talk to the pastor. And so we're aware that for many people, the on-ramp into getting engaged and planted with the local community and church can be difficult. So we've created an on-ramp for you, a three-week journey we go on with you that engages with who you are, the way God has shaped you, and how he wants you to be able to live out his purpose through who you are as an individual person. Also, how you can get planted and engaged with community in an effective way, which is comfortable and true to who you are, um, and so that you can explore more about the heart of who we are, making the confident decision that this is what you want to call home. And so if you're in that place with us, you're going, I want to know more about Southside because I'm interested in partnering, or I would like to take further steps to be more connected, what do I do? Or you're going, well, actually, I don't know how I can serve God's purposes because, you know, I've got this weird shape and I'm a very complex person. Uh, we want to empower and equip you over a three-week journey at something we call Growth Track. Um, it's not uh, a course where you get your Christian certificate. It's an empowering journey that integrates you into this community and informs you whether this is where you want to be planted or not. And so it starts this Tuesday, 7 o'clock in this building. I'm here with an amazing team that lead it. Um, there's coffee and food and there is kids care for your kids. So you get a date night because they're like... You know, go play in the traffic, kids. We've got someone safely caring for them, and you can just have a date night. So use it to your advantage, you know. Thus says the Lord, go on a date night at Growth Track. And so if you've got kids, bring them. We've got kids care. Um, 7 o'clock this Tuesday, and it would be for the next three Tuesday evenings at 7, and we would help you navigate an on-ramp into the life of Southside, we would help you navigate who you are and how you can serve God's purposes through your unique shape as a person. And so I would love to see you there. Come and join us, seven o'clock. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to fill in forms. You can just show up at seven. We had an a, a awesome group of, I think, 12 or 15 just go through the last growth track. We would love you to be part of it. So don't forget, seven o'clock this Tuesday, I would love to meet you face to face and connect and hear your story personally. As we multiply, as we're passionate about never maintaining where we are, we've got vision for the thousands of people in the deep south of Cape Town, South Africa, right here. We, of course, want to create as much opportunity as possible for people to be engaged in this ministry, to come under the word and, and have their lives changed. And so we will do everything short of sin to reach every person we can. Having said that, we know that in South Africa, Christians dissolve in rain, and winter's coming. So we have to be very strategic about creating as much opportunity for you and your family and your friends to engage in this space. On a Sunday evening at six o'clock when it's stormy and dark outside and there's a really good documentary on Netflix and you've just cooked 
macaroni cheese. And you're under the blankets. The devil is telling you to stay at home <laughs> and not come to a 6 p.m. evening service. <laughs> no, no, there's a level of wisdom. I would want the same. And so we're aware that as we go into winter, the evenings get very dark very quickly. It's often stormy. And we believe that we will help people uh, and remove the obstacles to people's participation by instead of running one morning and one evening, strategically going back to two morning services. And so from the 22nd of May, Sunday the 22nd, we are going to be launching two morning services, and we won't have our 6 p.m. service until summer starts, where we will multiply into a third service in the evenings, because we're multiplying, not maintaining. And so you will be able to choose between an 8.30 or a 10.30 from the 22nd of May. Some of you are like, Jesus, I've been praying for this, Lord. Yes, this is the right church for me. Okay, now I can come at 10.30. And so be ready. We will keep you in the loop with that. We're training with all our teams and those that serve. We're getting all ready. And instead of stepping back because of the situation, we're strategizing to multiply because we've got vision from the heart of God for the people of the Deep South. And so you will see that change in the services. And then next week is Mother's Day. Bring your mommy here. Okay, we're going to make it cool. We're going to have gifts for your mom. We're going to make them feel blessed. And then afterwards, you take them out for breakfast or brunch. And, and so bring your moms next week for Mother's Day as we celebrate them um, uh, together. <sighs> okay, lots of information. Let's change gear and get ready for the word. Would you close your eyes with me, if you're willing to do that, just where you are? You're in this place right now. You can't control the past. You can't control the future. The world around you right now in your silence is screaming at you for your attention. God wants you to be present with him. He wants you to be still and know that he's God. Knowing you're not defined by what you do, but what he's already done. God wants you to embrace the revelation of his word now, not just hear more information to add to your overloaded mind. Lord, as we're present, and we choose to be here where you are, we pray that you would let your word cut to our hearts in Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if you've ever experienced anxiety. <laughs> Everyone's like, <laughs> obviously. Half of you like on tablets when you walked in, didn't uh, you know, I took it this morning. Well, I was in my mid-20s when I started getting really bad with anxiety. I was newly married. We had had our first son. He was a baby. And there I was convinced that my throat was closing. Some of you have had this. Okay, I um, I, I became obsessive and had these periods of obsess obsessing, going to my wife and saying, just look down my throat, is it red? Because I can't swallow anymore. I would sit sipping on water, kind of like all afraid, just making sure my throat didn't close until eventually I ended up lying on the bathroom floor with my shirt ripped open. My wife uh, came looking and I was telling her I'm busy dying. Okay, so if you haven't had kids yet, And so I'm lying there on the floor. I can't breathe. I can't swallow properly. Something's wrong. She calls the doctor, comes to the house, and then he jabs me in my bum cheek just like the park rangers with rhinos. And, um, and this was a specific manifestation of anxiety in my life, but I still live with the tension of managing it based on who I am and the things I've gone through in my life. And the reality is that I'm not alone. Because in a survey done out of 14 countries research, South Africa scored six for the highest prevalence of anxiety. Tons of us experience it every day. Our world right now and the culture of our world is just creating this pressure, this unhealthy drive uh, around us in our lives. And so many people are now struggling with general anxiety of some sort or another. Maybe you don't think that you 
struggle with anxiety? Well, here are a few symptoms of generalized anxiety um, that include feelings of restlessness, fatigue, trouble concentrating, irritability, increased muscle tension, and trouble sleeping. And then I'm like this, then I'm like, okay, but God, how do portions of the Bible like Philippians 4 verse 6 work? Because it doesn't seem to be working that well for me. It says, do not be anxious about anything. <laughs> You're yeah, right, okay, praise the Lord. Sheesh, I should have just read the Bible and I would have been fine. You know, I'm, I'm saying, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Basic, didn't you know that? Go do it, you'll be fine. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If only it was as easy as it sounds, but it's not. I believe that. So why do I have anxiety? Well, first of all, God's not a vending machine. So it's not a code to getting the bar one you want for your life. But other than that, it leaves us with this question. How do I experience God's transcendent peace in my overwhelming anxiety? Now, as part of this, I want to do something very practical today. And so you would have seen on your seat when you arrived a piece of paper wasn't a reserved sign, as some thought, just a piece of paper. I would like you to pick that up or find it, and I would like you to keep it with you. Keep it on you. Put it on your lap, because just now you're going to interact with this as part of exploring today. So pastor, leadership teacher, and author of the book, Managing Leadership Anxiety, a guy called Steve Cuss. <laughs> I'm a Christian, I'm cuss. I'm like, but, but this guy, pastor and leadership teacher, author of uh, this incredible book called Managing Leadership Anxiety, Steve Cuss, explains that research has revealed that there are five common false beliefs that trigger general anxiety. So this is research studied stuff, and they came up with five key false beliefs that trigger general anxiety. It's interesting because he says, when he starts, he explains that anxiety is, is built around false beliefs. And this is so important to understand because I can pray as much as I want seeking transcendent peace like that portion of scripture told me and still remained imprisoned by my anxiety because of my own false beliefs and thoughts. That's why scripture says in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks, so is he. You see, you're imprisoned by the way you think. And so if we build the way we understand the world on a false belief, it doesn't matter how much you try, you're continuing to remain imprisoned in your own thinking and in your anxiety. And so he speaks about the fact that at the end of it, anxiety is built on false beliefs and that out of the five triggers they've discovered in research, the first of the five false beliefs that researchers have seen triggering anxiety is the belief that we should always be in control. I have control. Like, don't worry, this is going to be cool. I got it. I'm in control. He says that the second is the feeling that we should strive for perfection. That the goal is perfection in life. No, we need to work hard and get, you know, your ideal and dream about what you want or what your life's going to look like. We, we have this false belief that we should work toward perfection, that we can achieve perfection. He says, the third of these beliefs is that I should have all the answers. You know, when you're in a room and someone starts chatting and there's something people don't know and you feel the compulsion to know the right thing. He then goes on and says that the fourth is that we should always be available for other people. So the feeling like I, I've got to be available if the people around me are in need. I, I'm there. I've got to be there for, for those people all the time. And the fifth belief is that I should earn approval from others. I've got to work to earn my approval, my worth. I want you to look at that list right now. Control, 
perfection, having the answer, being available, earning approval. There's a pen in your pouch. If you're sitting in the front, there's a pen under your seat. And you will see that it says, my trigger on your card. I want you to take a moment, look at that list, and ask yourself this question. Which one of these false beliefs can you identify in your own life and write it in your space where it says my trigger? Take a moment to do that. Yeah, some people are saying only one. Just do one for now. The one that's most prevalent for you, that that resonates with you the most. I I need to do control and perfection in like one, but... Your kids' church is loud. (laughs) For all of us, we could at least identify one of those that if not was not obvious, resonated, that somehow touched a nerve or in some way we could identify. Now, Here's the crazy revelation about this research. None of those five false beliefs discovered by researchers as causes for general anxiety are attributes of man. They're the attributes of God. I'll drop the mic and leave now. Cheers, guys. You get the message. The research, scientific research, giving us those five key general triggers they've seen throughout the world with studies on people and general anxiety, none of them are attributes of man. They're the attributes of God. And as we realize this, we begin to understand that every time we fall into chronic anxiety, it's because we are trying to be like God. (laughs) Jesus, help me. Don't worry, you're not that bad. From the beginning of time, we have been tempted to be like God. In Genesis chapter 3, in the Old Testament, the devil tempted Eve with this impossible idea. When it says to us, the serpent told the woman, you won't die. God knows that the moment you eat from that tree, you will see what's really going on. You'll be just like God. As humans born into sin, by our very nature, we desire to be like God. And often we are unaware of it because we don't realize our false beliefs are driving what we believe about ourselves. I may claim I don't want to be like God, yet believe that somehow I'm in control. (laughs) Clinical psychologist, award-winning writer, Les Parrott writes, the more we mortals believe we can control our little worlds, the more we delude ourselves into thinking we are gods. So something has to change. And this is where I want to begin looking at the shift in managing anxiety based on this truth. And theologian John Stott, to set the context, explains so well when he writes, the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. So so God's salvation work is not only in his substitution on the cross for my salvation in heaven. It's his salvation substituting for the past, the present, and for the future. Therefore, in the middle of my present anxiety, his transcending peace is discovered by substituting myself with him. Where I am not able to control. Where I am 
imperfect, where I am not able to give all the answers, where I am not available to everyone in need, and where I am not winning the approval of others with my performance, God says, I am I am should be substituting I am not. In Exodus chapter 3, 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. In other words, experiencing God's transcendent peace in overwhelming anxiety begins by acknowledging that I am not God and by ensuring that my beliefs don't suggest it. No, I'm not God. I know that. Lord, you are God. I'm in control. In the New Testament book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 15, the author writes, let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. So, so Christ's peace rules. It's got to rule. But how can God's peace rule on the throne of your heart if you've substituted yourself in the place where only God should be seated? The essence of sin is man substituting himself for God while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. I need God's salvation in my struggle with anxiety, which requires that I substitute myself with him. You see, Jesus died the death you deserved, so you wouldn't have to take control of saving yourself with your insufficient human ability. Jesus died so you didn't have to perfect yourself to be good enough for heaven because he became the perfect substitute. Jesus died to bring salvation to all the people you could never be available to in your physical capacity. Jesus died to answer the questions of life and death you couldn't solve in human understanding. And Jesus died so you were washed clean of sin and approved as God's beloved without having to earn it. You were approved as worthy by nothing you could do but everything that Christ had done. And what that means is that every time you're experiencing anxiety, you need to ask yourself this question. Simple. Which one of the five attributes of God am I trying to fulfill in my own strength? Because I'm not God. Try and be God and carry what he does. Tell me if you get anxious. <laughs> it's like, <clears throat> I'm in control. That's the problem. That's what's triggering the anxiety. You may not be able to control this. You might feel overwhelmed, but stop carrying what only God can. Every time you find yourself triggered or, or stepping into anxiety, ask yourself, which one of the five attributes of God am I trying to fulfill in my own strength? You see, once you can name the attribute triggering your anxiety, then you're empowered to do something practically. So now you're like, oh, okay, I know the five. Go and get them tattooed on your hand or wherever so you can always see them. For the rest of your life, every time you fall into anxiety, you are now empowered practically to ask a question that will give you perspective and a way to work through things and surrender to God, finding the peace that transcends even the situations you might be struggling with. So here they are. Which one of the five attributes of God am I trying to fulfill in my own strength? Once you become aware of that in your moment of anxiety, then you can do what the New Testament book of 1 Peter tells us to do when it says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. I'm like, oh, now I know what to cast. It's like, what, do I just go, I cast all my worries on you and I don't worry anymore? No, 
Your worry is rooted in the fact that you're trying to be God somewhere you can't. So which one of the five? And I can go, thank you, Jesus, it's control. Now I can cast it back into your hands and let go of trying to do it in my own strength. See, when Philippians 4 verse 6 we were talking about earlier tells us not to be anxious, but to present our requests to God. It's about presenting before Him the situations that we never had control over. It's about presenting to Him the plans that didn't work out perfectly, the answers we couldn't find, the needs of others we failed to meet, the wrong things we've done that have left us feeling like failures. That's what we're presenting. We're not presenting him the plan because we're in control. Now bless what I believe is right. It is about presenting the very things that trigger the anxiety. We can experience transcendent peace when we surrender to God those very things we know are impossible for man because we are not. God. Sounds cool, hey, but it's not that easy. (laughs) You see, what makes applying this surrender harder than it sounds is the fact that when we experience anxiety, our bodies react by releasing certain hormones, such as adrenaline or cortisol. And this causes what is commonly known as the fight, flight, or freeze response. It's something that happens automatically in our bodies, and we do not have control over it. So what it causes us to do is often begin to react in the overwhelming experience instead of calmly responding. And when it comes to managing anxiety, the reaction and response are vital to be aware of. It is true that we can't control our body's reaction to anxiety, but as leadership consultant, speaker, and author Dr. Sam Chan says, you can control your thoughts, your choices, and your priorities. And we read in the New Testament of 2 Timothy chapter 1, 7, it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. So I I may not be able to choose my body's reaction to anxiety, but I am empowered to control my thoughts, the place from which I form beliefs, the beliefs that are either false and fueling my anxiety or the true beliefs in the power of my God amid my imperfection. Steve Cuss, who spoke about this research, said, Chronic anxiety fills the space where God's presence should dwell in your mind. You can control the thoughts in your mind so that his presence can come back and take the place of that chronic anxiety. And this is why the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says to us, it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That's why. It's, hey, I'm taking you captive so you don't take me hostage, filling the space where God's presence should dwell in my mind. That's what it means. So like science and psychology, what they think they're clever, well, it's in the Bible. Okay, so, so, so now what we do is we know our false beliefs about control and perfection, knowledge. We know that it can take us hostage, so we now have to bring it into submission to Christ with our spirit of self-control. And this means that we end up responding to our anxiety calmly instead of reacting. And this is an important part of overcoming anxiety. The fact that you can react, respond, and you don't have to just react. Psychologist and author, Dr. Eager, Edith Eager, writes, freedom is when you embrace your power to choose your own response. She was in Auschwitz. Her parents were killed. And she writes those words. Freedom is when you embrace your power to choose your response. In my anxiety, I'm still empowered with the ability to choose my thoughts. 
Jesus has set me free to choose my response to my anxiety because he invites me to cast the weight of control, perfection, and approval into his hands when I can't carry them anymore. So, back to our initial question. How do I experience God's transcendent peace in my overwhelming anxiety? By the chosen response of practicing the pause and remembering my power to choose, processing with curiosity the God attributed my trying to fulfill and position that attribute back into the hands of Jesus. You can read it for yourself. By the chosen response of practicing the pause, remembering my power to choose, I'm not a victim because I still have the freedom to make a choice. Processing with curiosity that God attribute that I'm trying to fulfill. Okay, it was control today, God. It's, this, it's control. Oh, I can see God. I'm trying to have answers for everything. Ah, okay. And then bringing or positioning that attribute back into his hands. Cast my anxiety right back into your hands. Okay, I let go of it. Cool. I don't have to have control. It's out of my control. It always was. But I don't feel compelled to try and be you anymore, so it's much easier. You can see that I used three key words. Pause, process, position. You'll find that it's on your card as well. Because you're going to walk out of here, and I'm going to now give you some more clarity on the practical application of this, but you're going to then know in your life something else to get tattooed. Pause, process, position. Pause, what am I doing? I'm freaking out, and I'm about to freak out. This happens to me every time I have that engagement with my, with my mom. Okay, don't worry, mom. My mom's here. I, it doesn't happen to me, I promise. But, but if you're, you know, you're like freaking out, then you go, okay, wait, wait, wait. wait. I'm not going to do what I usually do. Pause. Process, okay, okay, which one of the tributes right now am I trying to carry? Okay, then, then position, okay, Jesus, take it. I'm not having to be perfect for her and show her that I have to earn her approval. In your sight, I'm perfect. It's what you've done, not what I do, God. Whew. Pause, process, position. Let me go through those three quick as we come into land. So first of all, the pause. Pause in the moment where you would want to react. I promise you it can save you, not just with your own anxiety, but arguments with your wife or husband. Do not sin in your anger. It's like, <laughs> pause. And we can do that because we have the freedom of choice and a spirit of self-control. So the pause is about acknowledging your power to make a choice in response to your anxiety instead of simply reacting to it emotionally. <sighs> okay. I'm empowered to do something here other than just become a victim of my own emotions. And, and then once you've paused, you've taken your power back. And then you need to explore which God attribute you were trying to fulfill. You need to go back to those five and go, okay, well, right now I'm being triggered. And, and it's directly linked to one of those five attributes of God I'm trying to fulfill in my strength. Now, author Latricia Taylor, um, who sa she says this. She says, um, the opposite of chronic anxiety isn't peace, it's curiosity. So, so, so you can't become peaceful in your own strength, but you can become curious, you see. And curiosity is defined as an eagerness to learn or know. So once you've paused... Then you remember the power to choose over simply reacting. And then you engage in the process of curiosity, exploring which one of the five attributes of God you were trying to handle in your own strength. And this is where we get to the word process. So process is where curiosity asks which attribute of God I was trying to carry. Paul, got the power. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be curious and, and ask myself, well, what can I learn about what's triggering me? Which trigger is it? And then you go through that process just for a minute. You're like, okay, so it was this, God, okay, I recognize it's control or whatever it was. So when I was first uh, started traveling on airplanes, I, I would go and travel quite a, uh, just around the country to different churches. And um, when I first started flying, I had this debilitating fear and anxiety of flying. I, I wouldn't be able to sleep for two nights before getting on a plane. And when I boarded, I took tranquilizers. In fact, on one occasion, 
I looked so anxious to the air hostess that the pilot on a Kalula flight ended up coming out and inviting me to sit in the cockpit with him for the flight. No jokes. And, and then, then I had to reflect and become curious as to why I was so afraid of flying. And, and as I explored in curiosity, I realized control issues, major control issues. I'm like, the one word is control. I, I realized I, I had no control of the plane. I couldn't even feel a level of control in understanding why the plane's motion and movement would change. You know, I'd hear, and the engines, I'm like, no, why are they going, Jew? They should be going, Ew, it keeps us flying, Jew makes us die. And then I'd to so the person next to me, sorry, was that normal that went, Jew? And, and why are we turning? Where are we going? I, it was a control issue for me. And this acknowledgement of what I was trying to carry that only God could was the beginning of me actually overcoming my flying fear. Now I could take that need for control, recognize I was not God and therefore not able to control much of my life. And then I cast my need for control back onto God. And every time I walked into the plane, I had my headphones in going, I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm like, yes, what am I telling myself? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a slave to fear because I'm not in control. And for the first time I acknowledge I'm trying to be what only you can be, God. And so I could walk into the play in a way that God was and always has been in control, that I could give up the need to do what only He could. Only He could ensure my safety on that flight. Only He could control whether or not it dropped from the sky. And in any one of those situations, all I would ever be able to do is surrender to His sovereignty because I was not God. And that's where I broke this chain of fear to flying. And I actually enjoy it in many ways now. That is the pause. That is the power of the process. Which one of the five is rooted in what's triggering my anxiety now? And once we've curiously asked what a tribute of God we've been trying to carry, we then are able to position it back into the hands of God with gentle prayer. God, I'm not in control and I acknowledge that now and I let go of trying to control this. We do what 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says. We take captive that thought and we make it obedient to Christ. God, it's under your obedience and submission, not mine. Positioning your insufficiency into God's hands allows his provision of peace to guard your mind and heart. As I land, the New Testament book of Matthew chapter 14 speaks about this historical moment documented where Jesus does this crazy miracle feeding 5,000 people. Now, what happened was the disciples were with Jesus. Jesus had been healing thousands of sick people, but it was now getting late. And the tired and hungry disciples told Jesus that they should send all the people away to go and buy food from the local villages and towns. In response, Jesus told the disciples not to send them away, but to feed them. Nah, let's stay here. You guys feed the 5,000. <laughs> So, so imagine the anxiety, being a local fisherman, having a lunchbox, and being told now, give me a performance and be like God and make a miracle happen. I'm like, in fact, those disciples, I can guarantee you, were super anxious in that moment. In fact, we actually see their response when they say in that portion of scripture, they say, we, we, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. They're literally going, are you crazy? We only have this. I can imagine it must have been an overwhelming, anxious reaction. The di disciples felt out of control of the situation. I don't have enough here. For, I'd have no control. If I had 5,000 fish, then they could all have one. Then I could control the situation. They felt out of control. They felt responsible for feeding 5,000 people and meeting the needs of everyone. 
They felt responsible for having to have the answers for everyone's hunger and earning the approval of Jesus by following through with what he had told them seemed impossible. But this is what's so cool. In their anxious reaction to him, but we only have a few fish and loaves. His response isn't, you stupid man, have more faith. Stop being so anxious. This is what he says. In the same way he would respond to you with the anxieties that you've been carrying. In verse 18 of Matthew chapter 14, he says of the loaves and fish, the very thing they were going, this is impossible. He says, Bring them here to me. <laughs> Bring them to me. And Jesus, but I'm trying to control it. Like, you expect me to do it? Relax, relax. Give it to me. Position your lack of control, your failure to perfect, your need to answer all questions to be available to everyone, to earn their approval. Position it in my hands. Position the burden of making five loaves and two fish sustain 5,000 people into my hands. You see, Jesus wasn't asking them to do the miraculous like God. He was inviting them to let God do a miracle. But that would require that they positioned their insufficiencies into his hands. My insufficiency to have control, to perfect things, to have the answers to everything, to meet everyone's need, to attain my approval through a performance that's squeaky clean. He goes, don't worry about it. Don't be so anxious. Bring it to me. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Would you stand with me and hold your piece of paper in your hand? I want us to pause and have a moment with God. And a moment with that one thing we identified in those attributes. Control, perfection, need to have all the answers. I don't know where it is that you keep bumping up to anxiety and the tension and the sense of guilt because you've never got it right or being good enough or you need to do more. What you hold in your hand, that piece of paper is a symbol of an anxiety trigger that needs to be cast back into God's hand like the loaves and fish. And so I want us to take a moment with God and I ask you this question. Will you accept his invitation when he says, bring them to me?